Hello and welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And in this episode, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Yuli John Roth, legendary guitarist of the Scorpions, composer and the man behind the Sky Guitar. Yuli has just announced a new UK tour, which also extends through 2024 into the USA. And you've got numerous things being reissued towards the end of the year, uh, albums and also deluxe reissues, etc. You're a very busy man. Uh, so <laughs> when most people are slowing down, you're speeding up. <laughs> how, you, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. And yeah, I sometimes it feels that way. <laughs> you know, like, um, um, there's just uh, sometimes I feel I've got a lot on my plate and it's all self inflicted. So I've got nobody to blame but myself. So you've got. Um... Because one of those, one of the things I knew you're working on, I'm not sure if when you mentions uh, either PR release from uh, from your agent saying you've got a book in the pipeline as well. Is that the In Search of the Alpha Law book? That's the one. And um, with a bit of luck, that should come out before Christmas. Uh, I started writing that book a long, long time ago. Um, I've always been a bit of a closet philosopher, so to speak. And uh, this book has been in the making many, many years. Uh, but it was only uh, during COVID that I really had the, the, the time to full on um, concentrate and, and write it. So I had uh, various um, versions. I had written various versions before. It's now I'm never quite happy with the the actual um, outcome of it. Uh, and uh, during COVID, um, there was not, nothing much else to do. And I, I was able to completely focus on that book. And then I did. So it took about one and a half or like, like two years. It's a huge tome, um, over 650 pages. And uh, yeah. I'm very happy with that. So is this, because uh, is this a book kind of going underneath what inspires you musically and how music kind of affects people and how the effect it has on on the listener well, and on it, as being a musician is, as well? It is partially that, but, but it's, it's more than that. Um, it's all about um, a certain uh, way of looking at things. Um, which, which I uh, started to do many years ago. Um, I, I started investigating really what's, I don't want to say behind the music, but what's deep inside the music, because it's such a fascinating subject. And I always wonder, why is it that certain notes have a certain um vibe that others don't have and, and they, they all have their, their own identity. Why are certain chords resonating in a way with us? Uh, and what's the reason for it? And I found that there's some underlying laws which are um, uh, fascinating to to look at uh, once, once you start to realize it because uh, these laws that that govern like music or the essence of music, they're the same laws that govern us, our minds, our our uh, spirits, and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, I think the whole universe. You know, so um, in search of the alpha law is about uh, finding or um, uh, describing. Um, a, a law that is fundamental to all things. It's like the the first law of of being of becoming, and then all the other laws, uh, physical laws in the universe, are a variation of that. You know, so once you understand the, the first thing, then you can branch out and, and start uh, looking at all the other stuff. Because one of the things that I say a lot in my videos is that music is is a healer. It changes the way people feel and think. A story that relates to your music is I was a teenager in 1978, 79, 
and I I was listening to um, Flight of the Rainbow from Tokyo, you know, the oh. Tokyo live album. Yeah. And um, I, I was working in a factory. It wasn't very nice. Um, I came home. I wasn't feeling very good. And I put that album on. And I was at, at that age, I was kind of listening to hard rock and stuff. And it kind of made me, you know, escape from what I was feeling. But I remember listening to that track and the guitar solo and that sweeping tremolo arm and the and the way it was put together. But it suddenly resonated with me. And all of a sudden, I started to feel better, more um, positive. The room I was in was exactly the same. <laughs> I was wearing the same clothes. But all of a sudden, I was feeling differently without having a drink, without taking a tablet. And I thought, it's the power of, I thought this, that, this, and it was a guitar solo. It wasn't a voice. It wasn't, it wasn't about what the song was called. It was the notes and the way that it was being played almost felt it was rearranging my neurons <laughs> but but it made me realize then that music i was very young then but it made me realize that there's more to the reason what what draws you to music and when you see people in the crowd smiling or happy or crying the music is is literally if it's changing you isn't it on a deeper level yeah i completely agree i mean uh music is an amazing healer and uh I'm. I mean, you you put your finger on it. That's actually I've I've I felt that all along, um, and um, even back in the Scorpions, I always tried to put a little bit of that uh, healing essence, this positive essence that makes things whole, or that can uh, make things that are wrong right potentially mm -hmm. i always trying to put that into my guitar solos on some level you know i um i'm aiming for people to to take them somewhere just like like exactly like what you just described to take them from one place which is maybe um not so or perfect to a place which is more um uh yeah from an ideal world so yeah. to speak you know and i mean flash the rainbow is um a strange kind of um example for this because yes there is a little bit of a melodic uh, guitar solo of the the healing kind the searching kind in the the beginning but in the end it is um like very it gets very destructive because it is about like the yeah. Uh, the sinking of Atlantis, I mean, the destruction of the world, really, like in an Oppenheimer kind of uh, yeah. sense. So if you felt better after this, it must have had some really <laughs> cathartic power. It did. It did. Um, and, uh, but of course, like if you're doing anything artistic, it's not just about um, showing all the, the beautiful things, but sometimes you also show the ugly things and then and, and, and both sides of the coin. And I guess it is the, the journey or, or the thing that actually the, um, the, the act of being moved by something that um, gets you from A to B. So if you were like on the down up before and then something really moves you uh, emotionally, that actually already can make you feel better, you know, so... Yeah, you you have a, a deep love of the arts, as you say, beyond music yeah, as yeah. well. Did, did that come from your, from your dad, Cole? Um, you uh, yeah, I mean, he was certainly, well... He was an artist through and through, as was my brother. Um, and uh, he, he could do anything artistically, you know. Like, um, I remember one day, um, I was about five years old. He came home and he had bought some big canvas and he set up uh, a sca scaffold in the um, um, in the living room, oil colors, and then he started to paint the jungle scene, and it was really, really good. Um, and I didn't know he could do that, but later on, he uh, he taught me a lot of things, um, both uh, visually and then about um, writing lyrics and, and all sorts of things. You know, the um, the deeper connection to language. So yes, that, that that was a very uh, strong influence. 
But um, I, I gravitated towards uh, artistic things very early on. I was just fascinated. I, I mean, yeah, he took me to Rome. He showed me the Michelangelo Pietà, and uh, when I was in my early teens, and it really did, um, it really did open up a lot in, in my mind, and it led to a lifelong fascination with the Renaissance art and uh, art. Full stuff, I guess. Because you you started with classical guitar and piano, didn't you? So and I didn't start with that. No, I started without an instrument. I started with the Beatles. Ah, <laughs> yes. You know, I was um, a real Beatles fan. I knew all this stuff by heart before I even touched an instrument. And then, wow. um, a neighbor's friend he had a band, and somehow. You know, I wanted to be part of it. So I started to, um, you know, become an active musician. <laughs> that, I did the, the Beatles. I didn't start with the classical. The classical came in my early teens, you know, oh, yeah. after I already um, had learned the, uh, the initial basics of the guitar. And then, um, yeah, and then I started to discover... Uh, uh, like the, the piano music and the violin concertos and classical guitar with uh, Julian Bream, Andre, uh, and Andre Segovia. So these were like really big influences, you know. And then I started to play mainly classical for several years, um, although I still had a little bit of a band thing going. And um, but all that changed when uh, when the Scorpions came. I think I was eighteen or nineteen, and then I made a conscious decision to to go down that that route at yes. this time. You know, because I felt that the electric guitar at that time, I I could see so many things uh, that uh, in in my kind of like vague future vision, I could still see so many things uh, that uh, had not been done on the electric guitar. And uh, it was like, uh, I thought I could do a lot more like uh, um, ex exploration work then if I stayed on the classical guitar. So I made that dis decision then. Did that, did the classical kind of background, did it give you, do you feel like a, an edge amongst your peers at the time because you're obviously in a rock band and you, you you've got an understanding of classical music and the how it's. I, I guess it did, but I didn't think about it like okay. in that way. You know, I just I just did really. I didn't look left, right, or center as much. I I just focused on um what what fascinated me. You know. Yeah. There's a lot of light and shade in the Scorpions music, um, mm -hmm. and I know that people, when they think about you or the Scorpions, they're seen as a heavy metal band. But heavy metal now has at so that it, time it wasn't heavy metal. It was just no. rock I mean, music. The term heavy metal had just barely been coined, and yeah. really knew what it was at that time. You know, yeah. so we were at that time. If you, if you want to put it into a genre, it was considered um, a hard rock band, a melodic hard rock. Nowadays, you would probably call it classic hard rock. So that's what the, the early Scorpions were like, you know, not, not heavy metal. Although I did write some things later on, like um, Cesar Sharon, that uh, some people would classify as like either heavy metal or a forerunner of, yeah. of, of that, I guess. Did you did your kind of classical background come into the way that you constructed your guitar solos in the in the Scorpions, or was it? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, not so much in the very beginning. In the very beginning, I was just still actually exploring and learning the electric guitar, as I haven't been playing for an awful long time, you know. So you see, like, from every album, from the first one, which was uh, conceived in 1973, and we recorded in 74, then we did one each year. Yeah. If you just look at the at my guitar playing, you will see that there's, like, a quantum leap, like, every year, um, where it's almost like a different player, at least um, from a technical um, 
point of view. You know, I did learn an awful lot in those days um, because we were also touring so much and um, playing on stage gives you an advantage when you, you know, when you want to uh, come to grips with, with your instrument. It's different from just being at home in your, in your closet, so to speak. What, what's it like when you, because obviously you're saying that period you were learning like a quantum leap with each album as you were obviously learning the instrument, learning your way around it. And now in 2023, you're you're like revisiting this music from a totally different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, what's it it's... like playing those lines again? Or do you feel that you're adding your experience onto them now and giving them a different dimension almost? It is a totally uh, different perspective. I can still remember very well what it was like back then. But I'm now um, approaching these things from a different angle, and it's it's very interesting for me. You know, um, I always um, try to make sure that what was there originally that that is not lost, or that at least is still essentially there to um, a large degree. But um, there needs to be a different kind of um, point of view as well, you know. And of course, I mean, when you're 20, 21, you do play differently. You, you do, you, you, you play with a different um, attack, a different mentality, very carefree, you know. And uh, so if I um, listen to, to some of that stuff, you know, then I think, Wow, um, that's different. I I would do it differently today, but I understand what I was trying to do back then, you know. And uh, sonically, it's also a difference, you know, because uh, nowadays I approach things with the uh, with the sky guitar. It's a um, it's a more mellow sound. Back then, it was way more aggressive, and um, so. There are some people that say, Uli, why don't you play your white strat again? You know, <laughs> because we want that sound. But little do they know that when you actually stood in front of my amp at that time, it was like quite, um, <laughs> it was quite something to take in. You know, it was very brutal, very loud, very shrill. I kicked down my wall pedal to the, to the floor because the, the guitars back then didn't have much output. We didn't have all these gadgets and overdrives. And so really you played every note as if your life depended on it, like with maximum fortissimo attack. That gives a certain sound and, and intensity that you won't get any other way, you know? But um, uh, once you put um, a microphone in front of it, you, you, you would, get a very different perspective and it didn't sound as uh, harsh or brutal you know nowadays i prefer slightly mellower sounds and i don't really want that sound from back then um which is what i'm why i'm not uh, going down that that route it's, did that's, you was the was the strat your instrument of choice in the early days because of your love of jimi hendrix yeah absolutely um uh, Hendrix was my idol. I mean, I also loved Eric Clapton, particularly, particularly initially with the with the cream. It was absolutely phenomenal, and he was so melodic and so perfect. Uh, gave me a really good idea about also um, constructing solos because most of the other guitar players they were just improvising, jamming their solos, and I to me that sometimes felt a little flat. But both. Um, Eric and um, and Jimmy were different. They were actually uh, approaching the their guitar leads like composers, you know. Um, like if you listen to early Cream, like the track like Sweet Wine, I remember uh, being fascinated at that guitar, like the structure of the guitar solo. Or I'm so glad there was nothing haphazard about it. It was uh, very um, well constructed and, and and perfectly timed and perfectly played, you know, and, and I took a lot of cues from that kind of thinking. And I didn't see that so much in in uh, most of the other players back then. 
Um, I still don't see it today. You know, it's it's rare that um, that guitar players play a guitar like a composer. Um, most I feel are more casual, and they they just seem to be jamming on the the instrument. You know, but uh, sorry to get back to your your question. Yes, the Strat was uh, the defining instrument back then. I also had a Gibson Firebird guitar, which had a little bit more output. It was singing more, and I, I played that on the early Scorpions. But the Strat was very much my instrument of choice. Also back then, because you were an av- avid user of the tremolo arm, uh, and back then there was no like locking nuts or things like that. I mean, uh-huh. and, and, you, and you used it with such passion. Uh, really, <laughs> that, you, that you must have trying to keep your guitar in tune. Must it have was been. always out of tune. <laughs> it was always out of tune, and I wasn't very good with uh, mechanical things, so I had no idea to read how to really set it up. And I guess I just um, and I wasn't really uh, too concerned with it. I just found ways of somehow keeping it in tune uh, in, in a weird way, you know, like. Uh, if the string would go sharp after you abandon, you know, I would just quickly put yeah. it back and stuff like that. <laughs> there was a lot, a lot of that going on, you know. Uh, nowadays, my guitars stay in tune because they're set up much better. Um, so most of the time, after some tremolo abuse, the guitar will still be in tune. <laughs> but you, you still use that on your, on your, on the sky guitar. So is it kind of a does yeah. it is a part of your musical vocabulary and how no, you of course, it? of yeah. course. Just like just like I mean, you know, the the tremolo bar is um is like another gear on guitar playing, you know, it, like with a fixed bridge uh, tail um like on the Les Paul, you don't have that. You um it's one dimension extra. You know, a little bit like a slide. And uh, there were times when I experimented with it in a very musical way. I remember in the uh, days of Beyond the Astro Skies that um, I used it a lot for microtonal kind of shadings, very much in the way Jeff Beck would, although it, it sounded different. Um, I mean, he took it to a, another level altogether. Um, I'm still using the tremolo arm. Uh, for some of those things, but not quite as often as as I did in the past, I guess. When you moved on from the Scorpions, were you feeling that there's a limitation in the Strat then? Is that when you started to think about, um, you know, I, I need to reach, you know, these higher notes? And Yeah, the, yes, there were, there were two limitations. I mean, I, I, I love the Strat. It's a fantastic instrument, one of the... Um, yeah, the, the the best ideas ever in in rock um, for for the electric guitar, you know. Um, but uh, yes, there was uh, the the question of range um, because coming from all these violin backgrounds that um, that I tried to emulate, like these violin concertos, my guitar always was running out of frets when I like in a guitar lead and so um like even as far back as 1975 when i really first discovered the uh, the guitar as a virtuoso instrument you know i was pushing the top e string which was tuned a semitone down all the way up on the highest fret uh, achieving um an e flat which was really high at that time you know but uh I wanted to play even higher, and, and I couldn't, you know. So I eventually had, after the Scorpions, I eventually had the idea um, of putting a couple of extra frets on this track. And, and, and I, I met a, an excellent guitar builder in Brighton, Andy Dimitri, who um, did this, and he did it so perfectly that uh, it, it really did... Um, it really did expand the range of the, the Strat by by two uh, semitones, which was quite a bit. Yeah. And but I wanted more, and so he said, uh, "You know, I can build you any guitar you like." 
And that really was a bingo click moment for me. I started to think any guitar I like. And that's when I started to question all these previous things. I said, well, what could we change, quote unquote, improve on the Strat? You know, we can't make it any better in the way, like a Strat is a Strat, it's perfect in that way, but it needs to be a different guitar altogether or like a child of the Strat, uh, which takes it to another level. And that's uh, when the Sky Guitar was born. And the second uh, thing was the Strat was very much um, uh, a non humbucker uh, instrument back then. Uh, and it, yes, it, it did have that incredible clarity uh, of, of sound that you can only get with, with this also, depending on the wood and all the, you know, it was built from all the mainly or ash. And, uh, but I wanted a guitar that had a more creamy sound, like a, like like the brush stroke of a Rembrandt painting, more like a Les Paul actually in that sense. But I still wanted all the clarity of the strap. It was kind of undoable, and so um, that was the other other task for the sky guitar. The first was the range, so we gave it this uh, extra octave and a half. Um, extending it even to the seventh string, which ended up being, I think, the first seventh string in, in rock music. That was Mighty Wing, um, very much like this one. This is Excalibur. This is a seventh string as well. And um, then uh, we started experiment with to experiment with the the tonal spectrum. And I, I had a, I still have a very good friend. Um, bit of a um, electronic uh, pioneering genius, John Oram, uh, who built all these fabulous mixing boards in the 80s, like the Trident 80s series. They call him the father of British EQ, and, uh, and he is uh, unparalleled. So um, one day he came to me uh, saying, what would your ultimate pickup look like? <laughs> yeah. And that's how we started to then develop this mega wing system. Wow. Which is um, very advanced and very sophisticated and incredibly powerful. So uh, to me, like the, the Sky Guitar now, is like a Formula One racing car. And, and I cannot see myself going back to this track, maybe for the occasional song here and there, but uh, I'm very happy with Sky Guitar. Yeah. The other thing for eagle-eyed people uh, in around who look at this guitar and watch you play it is that traditionally, of course, as you look at a guitar, Nick, the frets get closer and closer and closer together. But yours does something quite unusual. The higher you get, it's, it suddenly gets a little wider. Uh, well, yeah, you're very perceptive. Um, the very first Sky Guitar uh, that was called the Dolphin Sky Guitar was actually built precisely... 40 years ago, no, 40, um, 30, <laughs> 30 years ago, not 40, 30 years ago. That was in 1983. And uh, it had all the frets going up towards the top. It still does. And um, it was playable, but only just about with uh, male fingers are, are, are slightly wider at the tips than female fingers, you know, maybe a female could get a great tone out of it, but it was really difficult to make those high notes sing. Uh, and I started to, um, I had the idea for a compromise. What if we um, take those very top notes, which I don't use that often anyways, um, and make them whole tone steps? So basically leaving out one fret each. Uh, the advantage is that, like on your top A, B, C sharp, you have a fully singing tone because mm -hmm. you think that's really fit. The disadvantage is that you don't have the semitones anymore and you have to kind of bend the yeah, notes yeah. in order to get them, which is tricky to say the least. But 
I made that decision um, early on, and so all the uh, Skagi does now have exactly that here from, you know, from uh, that top um, A onwards, they are um, full tone, whole tone steps. Yeah. So a little tricky to play, but um, the sound is just gorgeous when you go up there. And uh, and I I know several several really accomplished violin players who envy that sound, that particular sound when you go up these high notes. Did you did you ever consider learning to play the violin as it was such a? I have a, I have learned to play the violin. Oh yeah. Yes, I learned it when I was thirty. Because I wanted, that was the time when I really started writing for orchestras and I wanted to be able to write um, and really understand string instruments. So I got myself a violin. I took some uh, violin lessons and um, it took me about a year uh, to be able to sight read reasonably uh, semi-difficult things, you know. But um, I've never really seen it as, as my uh, main instrument because in order to do that, you need to start when you're three or four years old. Um, it's, uh, and the guitar and the violin has been pushed to its limits uh, probably even 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Um, the guitar... Uh, at least when when we started in the 70s and then late 60s, it was still kind of in its infancy of um, technical exploration, the, the electric guitar, and, and that's why. Well, well I, don't, I don't know, actually. I mean, you, you've, you've taken – it's a wonder you've not come up with a, a, a five-string violin. Um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I did. So that's, uh, I mean, you know, that was one of the first things I said to the violin builder. I built me that, and, and he gave me an extra viola string. Nowadays, again, that's nothing new. Um, my friend Nigel Kennedy has one, and he plays it gorgeously. Oh, right. Yeah. Because uh, that's good you mentioned him, because I know that obviously he's also a huge Jimi Hendrix fan. Oh yeah, and and has done um, an album, hasn't he, of doing like um, his interpretations of Hendrix he's, he's songs. Things, yeah. um, I mean, that would be something that for a future project for both of you to actually do something together, perhaps. Uh, I I think we will do something together once because we've we'll only spent like a week together at his place in Poland. Yeah, and, uh, it was an amazing week, you know. We uh, we played together, and um, very often he would just play the piano, and I played the guitar, or vice versa, and um, it, it was just great. You know, I I love uh, I love uh, playing with him. He's um, he is um, amazing and um, very inspirational. Oh, that's that's fantastic! Um, my my wife's a violinist, so she'll be thrilled, and that's that's her favorite violinist. Um, so to know that you both well, you know, yeah, work he's, together, uh, he's up there yes. in the top, very top, yeah, top echelon. Yes. So you've got piano, and obviously you've you've got violin for part, help you with writing. So when you when you write music, and obviously you know you are a composer, and classical music has always been so important to you. Do you write primarily on guitar, or do you start on piano, or do you just uh, it's um, it really depends on what it is, you know. Very often, I I write it straight into the computer ah. because um, yeah. you know. I mean, I wrote my first scores by hand before we had the uh, like these programs like Logic, you know. Yeah. And, you know, back then, it was called Creator or Notator, but uh, very soon I began to see the power. That um, the, the the computer can actually deliver in terms of uh, score writing, you know, like uh, it, it's just incredibly convenient. So I have not uh, done anything by hand uh, since since ages. Uh, I'm probably completely rusty there. Um, Do you think if you'd have had the technology when you when you did your album Earthquake, um, which was kind of what, probably the first neoclassical guitar? I wrote album. that. That music was still written by hand. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it would have changed anything, you know, because like Earthquake, for instance, back then, that, yes, that was written on my, it was written on my white strand. You know, and but I remember the um the bass line the, the, the bass line. Uh I actually wrote it on the base of Francis Buchholz. He uh, I don't know why, but I borrowed his bass for a week, his Fender Precision, and came up with this um bass line, which is uh, very unwieldy, but uh, and and difficult to play, but um as some some kind of uh, some almost magical kind of flow about it, you know. And yeah, became the basis of the um, of the, the main piece. Yeah, and that's that album's being reissued soon, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We um, uh, we have started uh, our own label. It's called Alpha Experium. And it's designed to uh, release like my entire back catalog in a way that that I'm really happy with without any um, record company interference. Yeah, and yeah. So we've got a really good uh, distribution company, and we're going to do all the albums, remaster them, and look at um, see. Uh, trying to get the best out of them. Like with Earthquake, we went back to the very original um, uh, uh, quarter-inch master tape, which we hadn't done before. Yeah. Usually when people remaster, they use remastering of remastering of remastering. <laughs> that's up very often. Very it's true. It's very yeah. digital after a while. So this one we uh, tried, uh, no, we went about it very conscientiously with uh, quite a few experts. Um, and uh, some of that uh, original top end had been lost over the ages. But it was uh, it was relatively easy to restore. But the these these original master tapes sounded much more like that which we heard back then in the studio than what you hear on like a normal record player. So that's interesting, and then I think it's um, uh, it'll be for it'll be uh, something for the collectors, you know. And maybe also for a newer audience who haven't heard this this music. Um, I mean, uh, the the artwork we're also putting a lot of uh, energy into that and make it as good as we can based on the original. But uh, we had these Monica Daneman paintings, two of them, and we're producing them, uh, yeah, to the best of. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, I was that's never awesome. happy with the originals, the way yeah. they out. Yeah. So just, yeah. So Earthquake is the first one, and it'll be it'll come out before our tour. In fact, mm -hmm. it is finished now. Uh, artwork and the remastering, and it's the first one that that will be there. I I just want to ask another question about the sky guitar because it's sitting next to you because it's such a beautiful looking thing that just that, that actually creates music just by being there be really quietly almost um, <laughs> uh, just it's seven strings now a lot of i mean you you broke with tradition by creating a, an instrument that's got extra frets etc and then you change the way that was put in and it's got seven strings i've heard guitarists play seven string guitars and they almost sound mathematical but you're you play with such feeling yeah. Do you know what I mean? You play with like soul almost. You, it's not just like to me the seventh technique. string. I um it, the reason why I came up with this idea was because I wrote a guitar concerto. My first concerto was called Sky Concerto. Quite predictably, it was <laughs> a, a, a piece which was over an hour long. Wow! I finished the composition, but I never actually recorded it. And there were several reasons, I, I, and I never finished um, orchestrating it because other things came and yeah, along. And yeah, maybe it wasn't quite uh, perfect enough. It was very much, um, uh, how shall I say, um, an apprenticeship piece for me. It was like my first full-scale, large-scale 
um, uh, structure which uh, takes a, a very different approach from from songwriting. Of course. You know? Um, but there were some of the, I mean, some of these runs when I, when I wrote it, I didn't really um, think about how to play it. I usually don't, you know, let my fingers dictate the writing. So some of it I wrote straight into the computer. And then when I looked at it and then I tried to play it, I realized, um, I had bitten off a little bit much here. <laughs> and I thought if I had these, um, this extra string, then um, I could, break. you know, I could. Um, you could reach new heights. This this bit, extra, yeah. basically, you know, and um, so that's why uh, the seventh string came. Now nowadays, I'm using it very much in uh, compositionally because you can uh, just do so many different chords and and the guitar. It's 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 almost like a different instrument. In fact, it is like a different instrument. Yeah. If you have a viola and the violin, you know, the viola is um, very much like a violin, but it is not a violin and it gives goes down to your, your bottom uh, C here, you know. And so now this one goes down to bottom B and uh, or this is the cello C, but sometimes I will tune it down to A and you you get a very uh, amazing bassy uh, resonance, um, and you can do all sorts of chords which you cannot uh, do on a normal guitar. You know, in fact, I took this to um, its own next level because in recent years I started playing um, uh, flamenco and um, uh, classical guitar on stage again on nylon. So we um, designed a uh, a nylon string sky guitar, which was wow. in seven. Then we had one which was eight. And the one I'm playing on this tour, on a couple of songs, it actually has nine strings. So it goes really low. And uh, you get the full, full spectrum on that instrument too. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite something. So on that guitar, on the electric seven uh, seven string, yeah. do you, what what gauge strings do you use on that? Uh, the, this would be a, a sixty, you know, um, sixty or sixty-two. Wow! And the others are pretty much standard. I, standard. I, I yeah. tend to I tend to have thick strings in the bass and lighter strings on top, usually in a, a zero eight or a zero nine. So quite, um, quite then, very light strings to very top, yes, because the zero eight has a certain shimmer when you um, when you play a, a vibrato that you won't get when the string is slightly heavier. Now, if I was to play more rhythm, you know, um, uh, then uh, the that eight string is a little thin, and it would sound better as a zero nine or a one. You know, but when I'm playing live, my my main task is to be the lead guitar player, I guess. And so I yeah, that that is a compromise, you know. If, so do you do you have, have several a, do you have several guitars with you when you play live because of the different tunings for different no, songs? No, 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 no. Um actually uh there, there are shows where um where we alternate the tuning between standard E or yeah. I could also uh, go to E flat. E yeah. flat. So I've got this uh, tuning device here. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Um, see, and this happens um, very quickly. It's it's because it's a floating tremolo. It will take a little bit longer, you know, um, because um, and that's. That's reasonably good. I and mean, yeah, it would still need one more tweak, you know. But uh, on stage, we sometimes do that. But most of the time, we will have the E flat tuning because of the Scorpion songs were in E flat. Now, the Electric Sun tuning was um, standard tuning. And that is a bit of a problem sometimes because some of the songs I don't prefer, I don't like them when they're semi toned down, you know. So, but anyways, um, 
Yeah, usually uh, we I I do have guitars there, but it's the the main reason is uh, for um, yeah, if I break a string, you know, I need I need a spare. You yeah. you've written you've. Because I know that you've just mentioned one, your first uh, concerto, and you've written other really big pieces as well that haven't all been made available or been performed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I've I've written more, uh, much more that's not available than what's available. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Uh, um, is that is that because so if you because when you write a song. It's you you put a pull a song together and it's a few chords and I'm sorry I'm not oversimplifying it, but you know, and the lyrics and everything, and it's it's done. But with something as big as potential concerto or string arrangement, it's like finishing a large painting. Is it ever really finished? You could always be dabbling with it. That's that's a very good point. Um, is it ever finished? It's finished when you say it's finished. Yeah. You know, you could. Uh, you could get, go at infinitum, particularly with orchestrations. There are so many different ways to do it. Yeah. And there are, uh, and, and there is always slightly room for improvement, I guess. You know, particularly when it gets more complex, and then you have to make choices: uh, yeah. is this really necessary, or yes or no? And the older I get, the more I'm realizing that. Less is sometimes more, <laughs> although certain other uh, musical philosophers would tell you different. Yeah, uh, but uh, it's yeah, it's to me, it's never quite finished, and because you know, just recently I've I've realized this when you um when you when you do an album, yeah. Uh, and uh, we were uh, archiving some stuff. I had some uh, some music from my Under a Dark Sky album, and I, I had it on the timeline for the first time since uh, 2008, I guess, when it was mixed. Um, and I brought up all the faders, and it was just playing unmixed. And it was completely different, a completely different mix from the one we chose in the end. But some parts were better and some parts were not as good as the original, you know. In the mixing process, you always have to make choices, 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 you know. Which instrument should have which kind of volume and, and which yeah. kind of sound. It's very much a puzzle and it's always just a compromise because um, because... Uh, you have all these different tracks that, that are recorded. In the end, you're just mixing them down to this tiny kind of um, two-track. Yeah, uh, It's a huge compromise, and it could be done in so many different ways. So I tend to see it always like a work in progress, you know, and uh do you have a do you have a visualization of what the music sounds like in your mind before you even start to put it down? Yes, uh, yeah. it was much stronger when I was younger. I was more um in that sense, I, I was I, I had more of a one-way mind. And during the times of the scorpion soil and the electric sun, I had an extremely clear idea of how I wanted it. And then I then I would move heaven and earth in order to get there. <laughs> and if I got there, of course. Um, yeah. I was never happy with the results, but I was kind of happy-ish sometimes. Um, my main emphasis was always on the, the, the thing that was most attractive to me was actually writing the music, composing it, to a lesser degree um, playing it, and to a much lesser degree recording it, because... The recording is always like you're pinning down the butterfly and you're actually killing it. You know, it's, it's about <laughs> alive because they have a moment in time, you know. And, Perhaps uh, it's um, also because you record at home. I remember reading an interview with John Lord when he did the concerto for group and orchestra. And he, he obviously, they just booked the Albert Hall. So he had a deadline. So it had to be done by that date. Do you think because you recording at home, you've got for, You've got infinite time to suddenly come up with a new 
piece I, of I think, Well, there, there is that, but um, uh, but the the underlying problem with me and recording is that I just don't really like the process. Of mm. it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I'm I'm never happy with the sound. Um, like when I hear a guitar in the room um, with an amplifier, I hear a certain 3D sound uh, which is in the room, and it's sometimes very very good. Uh, to get that sound into a recording via a microphone and via all these other things right in between. Uh, I've never managed to to find a way to make it so that I'm perfectly happy with it. It's it's to me it's always better in in real life than what they're actually recording, you know. So this um this fundamental compromise at the beginning <laughs> of things is such a flaw in my um yeah in the whole setup for me that uh, I've never I've never solved this problem, really, you know. So now it's what I tend to do is when I go into the studio, I have a more open mind and I'm trying to just live with what's there on the table rather than to um, go after it like a maniac and not achieve that which I'm going after. It's, it's a, yeah. a, approaching it differently. Um uh, there's less pain involved. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess that many... Uh, and sometimes yeah. the results are better. Uh, sometimes yeah. not. Sometimes I wish I was still that maniac from the past, going, fighting tooth and nail for every uh, inch of sound. Um, but uh, nowadays, I more and more, the thing that counts for me the most is the actual spirit and the what's the essence of the song and not so much what it actually sounds like because that is just really relative you know it's very important don't get me wrong but it's not as important as that which what you're saying it's like you know you're reading a speech and which has um a lot of very important elements, like I have a dream, you know, for instance. Yeah. It's the most important thing is the words, what's in that speech and which kind of picture does it evoke in you? Um, it's not so important, you know, what kind of paper is it written on, on what the letters are like, et cetera, et cetera. It's important. But the most important thing is really, what are you saying? What are you trying to say? What is the essence? What's the meaning, meaning of it all? I guess uh, I think a lot of uh, composers had this issue as well back in the day, or even now, where, where they would have variations on the music they'd written. They, they'd yeah, but I would be much happier as a composer, just like in the olden days, if I just finished the score, let yeah. others deal with interpret it. the integrity of how to interpret it because yeah. there's so many different ways to interpret it and when i play something i, I literally play it uh, differently each time it is kind of the same because of certain parameters particularly when you're playing the classical but i always go um at it with a very much the mind of an, of an improviser and somebody who still can tweak things at the last minute you know you're you're obviously very deeply philosophical and and spiritual in your approach to music and you and you are a such a superb improvisational musician i mean when so you as you say you play so differently when you is is that when you're on when you're in the moment on stage and you're playing a song and you do you know roughly where you're going to go or is it literally how you feel or what's going on in your life at the at I, It's a mixture of everything. I, I Whenever I play, I like, uh, particularly when, when I'm uh, improvising completely freely, it is something which is a, sp a, sp a split second thing. I, I look into the future, what's coming, but I'm always um, aware of where we've, already been so it's like uh, I see the clock is ticking in terms of energy flow like what have we just heard what have we just said 
um, a minute ago and um, what kind of uh, conclusion do we need, you know? So I'm always thinking structurally and I'm always th thinking in terms of energy, uh, like when, when, when building a guitar lead. Um, it's difficult to explain, but it's almost like you have, have a meter inside of you that tells you mm, this is uh, the energy of the battery, and this is how much you have, and you you have to uh, um, use that much to get from A to B, and um, to achieve certain uh, a certain. Don't want to say effect, but a certain resonance, you know. Is that uh, drawn from the audience as well? From the reaction? And the to audience that? is, of course, very, very important because of the psychic kind of aspect. Because uh, when you're playing on your own in your own room, you you are on your own, but you are connected to some spirit world. You are connected. You're like a medium, and and it flows through you. That is one thing. It's like you're tapped into into some kind of electrical field of energy. But um, when you're on stage, it's this is amplified by the fact that every person has that going on as well. Yeah, yeah. It amplifies it and. Um, there's a different spin that each person will bring in. So, like, one person might sit there and, you know, like, say, well, impress me, you know. <laughs> and they might be resistant to whatever you have to offer. And uh, you can feel it as a performer. Um, I tend to take that with a pinch of salt because that is their right. And I'm sometimes like that, you know, you're not always in the mood to go on to somebody else's journey, you know. But some people are with you all the way and you play a note and you almost can feel what they can feel. And um, it gets amplified. And the beautiful thing about a live concert is that um, a lot of these things, when you you play one note and then the whole audience or most of the audience can feel that note and together they all get to a certain point of um of unity which is totally beautiful and amazing so i am conscious of that and um when everything is right on the live show and then you have a good sound you have got a beautiful auditorium and a beautiful audience then um that that lift uh, that you get gets even higher and it brings you to a higher plateau. And in that way, you're basically, I see myself like maybe like a conductor or like, um, how shall I say, um, somebody uh, riding a, a horse in front of a, a winged horse in front of um, a group of others who are with me. You know, but I'm leading the way and I'm making the choices. Ah, we go left now, we go right, we have to take a leap or we go down, you know, and and that's it. So you're very much a leader at that moment. You're creating these um, these journeys. And the, uh, the idea that comes into your mind, uh, it, you instantly transmit it through the instrument. There is no... There's no boundary. It needs to be instant. And uh, uh, in, in that sense, it's very important that you don't exist. You know, like when I'm on stage, I really literally don't exist. I I know I exist. Um, there is kind of a director on my shoulder who kind of watches it all and kind of directs uh, your actions and movements to a point. But if you really connect with the music and just let that flow, and and, and you know you're um, you have the goods as an instrumentalist or an artist to instantly translate that vision that comes in. That's the best. And you you don't exist. You are you become the music, and 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 it's it's all one. You know those are the yeah. best moments on stage. That's why, and that happens particularly when you're playing something completely unscripted, something new. And that's where, to me, the, the biggest magic happens. That's why I always have some 
moments in in the set that are uh, reserved for or that that are unscripted completely free. I, I I think that's what I mean. Music is all about the transfer transference of one emotion from one person to the other, and I think the the audience also pick up on that that they're experiencing something that won't happen again in that same way exactly else. exactly that that's why to me it's important that every concert has a life of its own and and no at least on my concerts no two i ever like you know and and also quality wise some uh, some are better than others you know when when everything's right then you know it and you feel it and yeah. the audience knows so, it. so how how do you pre- prepare for a live performance do you have any kind of personal rituals that you, that puts you in no, the zone no ritual i'm always in the zone mm-hmm. i am in the zone you know um always i yeah. learned that i learned that very early on in the scorpion so started to med- meditate and um uh at that time uh I, I came to a point where when I went onto the stage, I look into one of the lights. I mean, that's really interesting to know that you're how you get into the zone and you've done that for such a, a long I, time. I don't get into the zone because you're, you're I, I am in the zone. I, I live in the zone. Sometimes I'm more in it. Sometimes I'm less in it. Yes, there, it's, it's, uh, there are grades of intensity. Um, and when you're on stage during the playing, uh, you get more into it, you know. But yeah. as soon as I touch an instrument, it's like a Pavlovian reflex. I will be in the zone immediately, and I and that's um, instant without rehearsing or whatever. That's why I don't, uh, you know, I don't do any finger exercises before the show. I, wow. I, we don't need need that, you know, um, because it's all it's all in the mind. Really. So, so, I, fi- so finally, you've got you've got the tour coming up. It's the UK. You're going to the USA, and it covers the whole of your career. You've got the Scorpions, your yeah, solo material. Why not the whole of my career? You know, but, because, uh, it's been quite a colour for yes. me. But uh, yeah, a good cross section. Yeah. yeah. And do you ever think finally that you some of your kind of longer and more classical pieces will you'll finish them and they'll be able to? Yeah, be- I mean, uh, we we are uh, working towards um, doing some big orchestra shows. They were already scheduled, but then we had the COVID problem, you know, and now um, we're at a point where uh, gradually things are falling back into place, you know. Okay, and so for people who want tickets for the tour or find out about you, they can go to your website. Yeah, website, I guess you know, website, the internet, yeah. uh, whatever you know. We're we're doing um, a full scale English tour first, yep. and uh, in the middle of November, and then we're doing some uh, shows also on the continent in in Europe, which have not been advertised yet, and. Uh, Last but not least, in April, we're doing one and a half months of America. So, wow. Well, yeah. I've, I've looked at the date list. It's absolutely huge. So you're no, going. No, that that'll be much bigger because yeah. he's still walking. Wow. Um, yeah, there's there are still quite a few others to fill. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julie, for all of your time today. I really Thanks appreciate well. you talking to me and um, take care. And um, hopefully, I'll talk to you. You know, I'm um, just saying the reason why I'm always looking left is because my monitor is left. And if I want to see you, I have to, but I should really look here, shouldn't I? That's all right. I, I, I really appreciate <laughs> your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So thank you for watching and listening. And a huge thank you to my guest, Julie John Roth. Full details of his tour and release schedule can be found on the website which is on the screen now and also in the description on the youtube channel and on the website please visit the now spinning magazine website at nowspinning.co.uk subscribe to the youtube channel become a patron become a youtube member visit the facebook group as well if you wish we're everywhere and of course subscribe to the podcast which you can find on apple amazon Google and everywhere else. So thank you for being here and thank you for supporting Now Spinning Magazine. Take care, everyone. Remember, music is the head of the doctor and I shall see you on my next episode.